Hey everybody, Syntax77 here. Today we're going to read some viewer comments and get some discussion going on my latest Camping in a Snow Trench video, as well as open some various packages and letters. Mail, mountains of it. It'll be a red letter day when the postman blows mail call. All right then, so let's get right down into it. Now, I think, let's see, I'll start with uh, some comments on YouTube, get my app up here. Now, most of these will probably be from the latest video I posted, which was Winter Camping in a Snow Trench uh, Bivy Bag Adventure, Sub-Zero Bivy Bag Adventure. So we'll just skip through here and see if there are any comments that bring up some good conversation, maybe answer some questions out there, etc. Um, so first things first. Uh, this person says, you need to have a very, all caps, very good fire going. I don't understand. This is a little hard to read because the grammar and the spelling's a little off. I don't know if it was text-to-speech or perhaps he had a few lemons left over from the Studio 54 days. But oh, let me try to figure this out here. You need to have a very good fire going. I don't understand. A fire gives off here. Heat is what he's saying, but yet you're too cold. Explain, please. Keep the long videos coming. I enjoy, I enjoy them. Um, that's from Harley. Thanks, Harley. I'm glad you're enjoying the video. Sorry, I had a little trouble getting through that. The gist of it here does bring up a good subject. So why were we still cold even though we did make a fire during that video? Well, first things first, we didn't have a ton of wood, even though where we camped compared to other places in the Whites. I would call it abundant, but it was still limited. There was a bunch of snow, multiple feet of snow on the ground, so most of it was covered up, but we were lucky enough to have some deadfall. I'd say like small to medium-sized stuff, and we were also in really tight quarters, so we didn't want to have, even if we could, which we didn't have really thick logs or anything, we didn't want to have a huge kind of rager bonfire because especially with the snowpack lifting us up, we were actually pretty close to some dry limbs and, and trees and whatnot. As a safety standpoint, that's one thing I'll bring up, but that's really not the main thing going on here. The truth of the matter is we had the limited amount of wood and we didn't light it until after dinner at night. So that's one factor. For the majority of the day, I believe we got there to camp, what, around between 1 and 2 o'clock? p.m. or so and we didn't light the fire up until oh I forget sometime after dark probably 7 30 or 8 o'clock um, so we were really cold during the day there was no fire now beyond that though even when we had the fire I mean if it's summertime and you have a fire you can probably feel that heat from like I don't know maybe 50 30 feet away if it's fall or winter you got to be a little closer when it's below zero um, a fire is great and it's nice and warm, but you got to get close to that sucker. Just because there's a fire, you're not instantly like going to be completely warm when it's that cold out. Another major factor is, yes, we were warm, I should point out, when we're standing near the fire, or in our case, kneeling, because we were on a, a snowbed, right? As the fire developed, I mean, by the time we left, it was probably from here to the ground, it was a few feet deep snow pit. So you'd kneel over top of it. You'd almost try to keep yourself from falling into the thing to heat up your hands and whatnot. So when we were near it, though, it was definitely warmer and we could localize, put a boot near it, a, a hand or something like that. But you got to remember, most of the time, we're not near the fire. We're away from it doing chores. We're melting snow. We're getting camp ready. We're prepping up food, which wants to, even when it's cooked hot, like the macaroni and cheese, it wants to freeze like within <laughs> minutes, it seemed like. So what we would do is we would go back and forth to the fire. This is mostly the next morning, by the way, because like I said, we didn't have the fire until after dinner i believe but the next morning is actually when we had our coldest uh temperatures around 7 a.m from looking at the weather data uh i'm not going to spoil the video too much but we did have a fire that morning and we were trying to do a bunch of chores i'll just leave it at that and stay warm at the same time so you basically do some chores you'd start to get cold especially if it was something requiring dexterity where you had to take a layer of gloves or mittens off You'd start freezing, you'd run over to the fire, you'd heat up a little bit, and then you'd go back to what you're doing. So, yes, the fire was awesome, but it's not 
a guarantee that you're going to be super warm. Unless you're in a really critical survival situation where it's just like, hey, this guy's messed up. We're going to leave him right next to this fire as close as possible. And then I'll go do the chores. But, you know, for the most part, that's kind of how that went. So there's my little fire spiel. Let's see if I can find another comment. And then maybe we'll open some packages. I got some uh, interesting stuff here. I don't know what's in it. Oh, wait. I think I just had a guess as to what this is. But hold on. Um, ba, 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 ba. I have a U.S. Army issue bivy. Works great. I remember the theme of the video we just did that I'm talking about was using a bivy sack. So he has a, this is Josh, Josh B. He has a U.S. Army issue bivy. Works great. I think a better tarp with more tie downs or higher walls would have helped with the wind as well. Either way, great content. Thumbs up. Thanks, Josh. Yeah, the tarp was actually kind of an afterthought. Originally, I was like, let's challenge ourselves with just the bivy. And then at some point I was like, let's bring a tarp just in case. And then when we got up there with that high wind, luckily our camp was kind of sheltered, but we still had a lot of snow blowing around because the wind situation, which you can see in the video if you haven't seen it already. But that's why we busted up the tarp. And it's just the one that Mike and I happen to have. We kicked around the idea of bringing up a giant, like kind of Walmart trucker tarp. But we didn't do that. We brought the Cuban fiber. We almost were kind of intrigued by would it work because that is a narrow, a narrower tarp. It's eight and a half feet wide by 12 feet long. But when you really pitch it down flat like we did, we got two people under it just fine because you're not wasting geometry by doing a high angle on your A-frame. It was almost not an A at all. We got it really flat. Um, so that worked out. So yes, there would have been better tarp options, but that's kind of what we wanted to experiment with and what we were working with. But that's a good point. And the army bivy, I'll have to look into that because I also did mention in the comments section, um, maybe the last mail call or something, that it would be interesting to do a trip with all military surplus gear. And I did get some response to people said they'd be interested in that. So I'm going to add that army bivy idea to my... Um, list of potential things for that upcoming trip got a bunch of fun upcoming stuff on the way uh this one says i think alcohol freezes at negative 75 or negative 175 should have googled, googled it first oh that was josh as well i don't know i'm pretty sure when we were in iceland we froze a bottle of vodka by accident because it was in the back of the freezer too close to the element freezer works good <laughs> yeah the only thing that didn't freeze was the brain that i've never seen vodka freeze Ever. And I'm pretty sure I looked it up and it was negative 20 um, for hard spirits, but who knows? Anyway, if you don't know what I'm talking about, uh, it'll become apparent in the video. Theory confirmed, you guys really are crazy. Of course, what does that say about me? I just watched an entire one hour and 17 minutes of video. That's from Kenneth. Yeah, and a lot of people, there's a whole thread on here, people going back and forth. Um, somebody said that now that I'm posting the longer videos, which I've been posting hour videos since 2000. 12 or so this was an hour 17 uh he said the longer videos he's unfortunately just not um bothering to watch them or something to that effect but the overwhelming majority of you seem to be saying that you're fine with the longer videos and my response to him that some of you seem to agree with is you can break a video into as many parts as you want you don't need me to do it for you that's the beauty of youtube we're not watching uh, abc at eight o'clock and if if you miss it it's over because it's 1982 and you're never going to see that again you can pause it and come back anytime. YouTube, Google, whoever you want to call them, they watch your progress. Next time you come back to the video, it starts up right where you were. So you can watch it in one sitting if you're down like that. That's what my wife and I do. We watch YouTube on the TV, just like television programming. And we watch our programs all the time. Don't worry about it. But sometimes we might watch 15 minute chunks, especially if I'm in bed and then another 15. So it seems that the response on the long videos is good, even that hour and 40 minute one. So I'm not going to worry about the time anymore. I'm uh, pretty happy with that, and it allows me to make just one concise, well-rounded kind of story arc video without worrying about wrapping up these sections. It just seems like I tried that for a couple videos. I broke them into parts, and I didn't end up liking it. I like to just present the whole the whole piece of work and then let people have at it. Um, all right, let's open um, a package. I'm going to open this one. I don't know what it is. It was at the PO box, and... Um, it's it's actually from Amazon. Somebody else sent it to me. So let's see what it is. <laughs> oh man. Oh man. This is gonna be the flashlight and salt channel soon. Which I'm happy about. So this is even comes with an Amazon gift receipt. A silky saw. A gift for you. 
Hi, Syntax77. Enjoy your gift from Lance M. Lance M, thank you. You are awesome. Now we're going to have to compare this to the... Where is it at? <sighs> the Baco Laplander saw that Steve sent. Uh, another viewer that was very nice. So I took this on the trip with Mike and I. Now, like that we just did. Now, like I said, it was a lot of medium to small size deadfall. So we didn't have the larger logs that probably would have made the bigger fire. Although, like I said, it wasn't the end of the world that we didn't have that. But there was a couple occasions where we had some larger stuff. And uh, Mike got a chance to try this out as well. And this guy worked really well. But I got to put it through some more paces probably on my next trip. Because uh, like I said, we were able to handbrake a lot of stuff. But this thing was cool. These are the two most suggested saws when I did that, I believe it was a mail call episode where I said, no, it was my winter camping on the Appalachian Trail video, which was fun. You can check that out. I'll link it above. My Coleman saw finally broke, so I asked for suggestions. Top two were these two. I think it's amazing that I have viewers that are so nice that, um, and this is not from the company. This is not a company that wants publicity or anything. These are really awesome just viewers that are... Um, just being really nice and, and helping out the channel and I like it. So we'll share this with people next. This is the Silky, let me see the details. The Silky F180 Professional. Looks great. Hard chrome plating. Now the key difference between these, at least that I know of right now off the bat, that has been pointed out to me, this Laplander, uh, like a lot of saws, there's two, ty two types of saws basically. Ones that work on the pull and the push stroke and that's how this guy is. And then the Silkies, I believe it's on the, I know it's only on one. I think it's only on the pull stroke that it actually cuts, right? Oh, there it is. Silky saws are designed to cut on the pull stroke. They bolted pull stroke. The thin blades will not bow because they are under tension while being pulled across the surface to be cut. If your saw ever becomes caught in a branch, squeeze. Do not push hard and never wrench the handle. Yeah, so... I actually mentioned in a comment to somebody, I totally forgot about this. Mike, who just went with me on that trip, he had a silky gomboy saw uh, years ago. He only used it once. It was on the trip, another below zero trip that we took with TJ. Uh, when Sub-Zero Camping Goes Wrong is the name of the video. He had it and there was a large piece of wood he was trying to process because we had very little wood and kindling at the campsite that we were uh, kind of ended up with on that trip anyway it was a really big kind of down tree and the way it was it was kind of putting pressure on the blade anyway plus it was a uh, negative 25 at this point in the day maybe negative 10 whatever cold 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 and he was going to town on this thing really working it and the blade just broke on that now i'm not saying that as a ding against silky i'm i'm pointing out that no discredit to Mike, but I have a feeling that maybe he, in those conditions, and it was a brand new saw, I probably would have done the same thing and forgot to treat it um, as a the fact that it cuts on the pool only. So I'm going to test this out and see how it works. Maybe do a little side by side with these two guys and take them both on a trip. So that's that. Silky F180 and the Baco Laplander. Thank you very much, Lance M. That's much appreciated and brings up a cool topic. Thank you. Uh, what else I got? Now, this one I knew was coming. This is a big old bag of goodies from Dutchware. Just a little foreshadowing. These are all accessories for the Chameleon Modular Hammock System, which I love. And uh, these goodies here, well, I'm going to do a separate video probably with Sarah and Denali. And we're going to go through all these and really show you a bunch of different options because... That's a pretty fun system that you can really customize. So that's what that is. Stay tuned for that. Oh, also stay tuned. Uh, I mentioned before, I'm looking into doing t-shirts. I have a sample being sent out. Syntax 77 Cheeseburger Time t-shirt. It's going to be a one of a kind. I don't know what the response from you viewers out there is going to be. So I'm just doing a limited edition. We're going to run it for two weeks. Once I, I'll put a video out to announce it and I'll show it to you. We'll run it for two weeks. See if people respond. If enough people order um then it'll go through but that'll be it just two weeks and then we're done that way i know that i can actually or whether or not i actually have the interest to put a shirt out but some of you have mentioned you want that so hopefully uh you'll enjoy that so stay tuned for a t-shirt uh what's next here let's open a letter uh this is from scott in quincy massachusetts 
Uh, my brother and I stumbled upon your videos a few years ago and have become regular viewers. At this point, we've logged about 500 miles on the Appalachian Trail. That's awesome. Uh, so you can see why I enjoy the videos. Well, I'm happy about that, man. Oh, and you're going to Iceland soon. Oh, you just got back from Iceland. Wow, awesome. You used our video. We have two Iceland videos out at this point to research for the trip. Thanks, man. I'm glad you enjoyed that. And it looks like even with a KP index of three, you saw the Northern Lights. Congratulations. Northern Lights are amazing. I'll send you some stickers, man. Glad you uh, got something out of those videos. Uh, this is from Z-Bird, a.k.a. Zach. Uh, enjoys the videos. Just recently visited Pinnacle Lookout on the AT and found you and Mike's old camp which is where I went back to in the winter camping, hammock camping on the Appalachian Trail video. Very cool. Says he spruced it up a bit too. Well, thank you very much, sir. I will be sending you a sticker. Thanks for the support. Let's uh, maybe go to a comment real quick, see if there's another subject there. The SOL bivy is only suitable for people of very small stature. This is from the Skittis, the Skittis. If you're willing to accept a bit more weight, there's a far superior product available. Yeah, Mike had, um, Mike's larger than me, lifts a, lifts a little more weights than I do, and um, I fit into my bivy sack just fine. His was a little bit of a tight squeeze. We kind of foreshadow or get into that, I should say, on the video. Uh, this person says I'm in no way affiliated, but I'm just a hiker. I started out with the SOL bivy, which is what I used, um, both of us used in that video, two different types. But now I tried the two go systems and never looked back. So a different type of bivy here. Let's see. The V3 Trifecta, 65 bucks thermal bivy blanket. Okay, man. Looks interesting. Oh, this one has a zipper on it. Two sizes, standard and XL. So that may be like an XL is what Mike needs. Yeah, so the world of bivvies is a whole nother world that really Mike and I just dipped our toe into on this trip. But they do seem pretty cool uh, for both emergency situations as well as when people go out on purpose and use these things. Although a lot of times they probably use more of a bivy tent where you have a little bit of structure to keep some area above your face and a little bit of your chest. But anyway, yeah, I will check that out. So thank you for that heads up there, Skytis. And I'll look into that. Uh, this is from Mike. Hey, really big fan of your videos. I'm new to backpacking, hammock camping. Getting ready for a three-day trip on the Pinhati Trail. Hope I said that right. I've heard of it. It's been suggested to me by a lot of people. It's down south uh, in Alabama next month. Can't wait to get back into the wilderness. Yeah, I feel like I looked into the Pinhati Trail or is it Pinoti? Uh, I'm sorry. I, I, I should probably look into that as well, how to pronounce it. But I think the reason I haven't been there yet, I think it might be I'm on the Mid-Atlantic, a little south of Philly and Delaware. Uh, just over the line. I feel like it might be on the cusp of pushing it for me. I usually like to keep my drives around nine hours. I'll push it to 11. When you get into the 12 range, it gets a little tougher for me logistically. I feel like it's a little further for me, but I got to look into that because it keeps coming up. Um, and so does Michigan. We'll get there, but I'll send you a sticker, buddy. Thank you. Um, and yeah, please. I do appreciate when people chime in with trip ideas and locations. I love it. Thank you for everybody that does that. Now let's look at this. I'm pretty sure now that I'm picking it up, I do remember what this is. But let me open it up just to confirm. Because it seems like it could be a book, right? Just to open my fancy knife here. Gentleman's knife. Let's get this open properly. There it is. Uh-huh. Where you'll find me. Risks, risk, decisions, and the last climb of Kate Matrasova. And look, I know that sign right there. I don't know if my camera will focus on it, but boy, if I put that in a lot of videos and that enacts some visceral memories for me, that's the uh, good old White Mountains stop. This is home to some of the world's worst weather sign that lets you know that even in the summer, some bad things could happen. So this, wow, this book's in really good shape too, man. So let me tell you the story here. I had a viewer reach out. He actually emailed me. And his name was Sean, along with his uh, girlfriend, I believe it was, Kelly. And he said to me, look, I'm a broke college student, but I love your videos and I want to do something to say thanks or I want to send you something. And he listed a bunch of different things. One of them was like a $50 gift card to some outdoor place that he had come across, as well as a few books and uh, maybe something else. 
I felt bad. I don't want anybody to send me anything, but I also don't want to be a jerk either. I definitely wasn't going to take a $50 gift card from somebody. Um, books? Uh, well, I should also mention he listed this book that he was that he had as well as Not Without Peril, which is a great book. I've brought it up on, on this channel before. Even if you don't, even if you're not interested in the White Mountains specifically, please check that book out. I'll put a link to it in the video description here. Uh, an Amazon link if you want to support the channel. Go ahead and bookmark those Amazon links. But uh, that book is awesome and I love it, but I, I already had it. So I said, you know what, man? If, if you're truly done with the book, I will take it. Although I feel bad he paid for shipping too. But he responded and said that he was going to send this book. So big thank you to Sean and Kelly. Um, oh no. And now I'm reading this paper and I've, you have received the gift certificate from Sean F for $25 to Packet Gourmet. Oh my God. Dude, thank you. All right. Well then we're going to have to get some food from Packet Gourmet, which I've shown on the channel before. I love it. Maybe I'll get something, something new from them and uh, kind of review it or show it on the next trip. So thank you, Sean and Kelly for contributing to the channel. We'll get something fun from Packet Gourmet. That's really awesome. And I'll check out this book. Has anybody read this book uh, where you'll find me? I believe, well, let's see. On February 15th, Kate Mat Matrasova, an avid mountaineer, set off before sunrise for a traverse of the northern presidential range uh, and the White Mountains. Late the following day, rescuers carried her frozen body out of the mountains amid some of the worst weather ever recorded on these deceptively rugged slopes. Oh, wait a minute. On February 15, 2015. Holy crap. This is about her. I think. Her gear included a rescue beacon and a satellite phone. Oh, that's freaky. All right, I'm really interested in this. I already mentioned the video on, on this video. Not to get too meta, but the uh, When Sub-Zero Camping Goes Wrong video. It's the one where Mike had a debacle with his sleeping bag. It was supposed to be a two-day trip. Things ended up changing. It's also the one where I said it was negative 25. That was the week before this woman up went up there. And I should point out, our plan was where we were on that video. We went up the airline trail, which is near King Ravine. And it comes up to this kind of junction area above tree line along the presidential range where there's Mount Adams and Madison and just the length of the presidential range. It's a really beautiful area. It's on the video. We got to it. We show it. I highly suggest at least just checking out that part, especially for reference to what I'm talking about here. We couldn't find the very small sub trail that we needed to get to this area we thought we were going to camp. It was just the snow was so high you couldn't tell where the trail was anymore in this above tree line section. It was just all screwed up. So we ended up backtracking out of there. Plus it was really cold and windy. Anyway, one week later, in that same exact area, that junction area, she was, as far as I know from reading the news reports, I think she was planning to do Madison and Adams, like a presidential traverse in the winter. I might be messing up some of the details. Anyway, brutal conditions. It was really cold, plus on top of the temperatures we had, and it was windy when we were there, even more severe wind. I think it was like insane wind, which means the wind chill was brutal. Anyway, her boyfriend... Dropped her off the trailhead. Um, she had a lot of experience, but she went up there. She had an emergency beacon, and at some point she set it off, and um, she didn't make it down. I remember that because it was right after we were up there, and it had called it quits on a trip. Spoiler alert, but we cut that trip a little early. That's why it's called When Sub-Zero Camping Goes Wrong. All right. Crazy. Well, thank you um, again to Sean and Kelly and I'll be checking this book out. Like I said, if anybody's read this, let me know what you think about it as well as the Not Without Peril book. But there's my little book corner. So that's awesome. What else we got? A couple more things. Maybe get some topics going. Big old envelope. This is from Steve G. Kindly send me the coveted Syntax 77 bumper sticker. Love the channel and your adventures. Enjoy the reviews and thoughts on gear and uses. Sticker on the way for you, Steve. Last letter, I believe, here. Maybe I'll look for one more comment, but I think we're probably running about that time where you guys are ready to uh, move on with your day. Let's see. Ah, oh, this is another Steve. So many Steves. This is the Steve that sent the saw. Remember I said sent this Baco saw. 
and he totally forgot to include some stickers. He wanted me to have one and I gave one to Mike. It's Explorers of the Wild. And that's Steve's YouTube channel that he just started up. So I will gladly give you a plug because you were cool enough to um, sincerely send me a saw. So that was cool. So check out Steve's channel. It's uh, Explorers of the Wild. I'll link it in the video description below. And uh, speaking of stickers, he's got some too. So I'll put this to use myself. Nothing like trading stickers with somebody. All right, where are we at here? Oh, I do have one more package. I was wrong. This uh, says right on there, I can tell. It's from Aqua Clip. Now, they've sent stuff before. I don't know if this is different. Mm -hmm. I forget which mail call. But it was one of them. And he sent some clips that hold your water bottle. Uh-oh. Should have used the knife to open this. I just tore the top of your note off. I'm sorry, buddy. I'm going to tape this back together. He sent photos and I just ripped it. Sorry. Sending you a few free water bottle holders I invented called the Aqua Clip. Yeah, I showed these before on the channel. So they kind of go on your water bottle and you can slip it on your backpack. And if you don't believe me. See? Oh, on your jeans. I didn't, I should have thought of that. Yeah, you can put it on your jeans. Oh, all right. And these are happy hikers. I bet you this is Brian who invented it. Brian, I tore your head off and I'm sorry. I sincerely did not mean to do that to you. But there he is, Mount Rose on, what's that, the Olone Trail? Now he's out in, where's that? Huntington Beach, California is where the Aqua Clip return address is. Maybe that's a trail in California. I haven't been out there yet. My wife's been in California, but I've never been hiking in California or been there myself. Someday I will. He says it works best with a smart water bottle or works with molly webbing too. So there you go. That's always a good thing. Stay hydrated in the field no matter what you're doing. Nice. Thanks, man. Those are the Aqua Clip. Very cool. I'll try to find a link to that and I'll put that in the video description as well. Uh, one more comment. This is from Andrew S. And he says, how would those bivvies do just by themselves without any ground pads and sleeping pads? Just what you were wearing. Good to see people actually test these bivvies. Got to get me some myself. Well, what we were testing were uh, SOL brand emergency bivvies. Mine was the emergency light, which is around five-ish ounces. And Mike's is around eight or nine ounces. It was the emergency kind of regular. They are actually for emergency situations where you very well might be in a situation he just described. I would not do it to myself on purpose, although maybe I could do a test someday, but I'd probably still bring other stuff as a backup. But yeah, if you're on the trail and your buddy gets injured or you get injured or whatever, you can at least have that even on a day trip, day hike, throw that in your pack, just always have it in there. And yeah, it's water resistant and it's breathable and it has that reflective coating on the inside to reflect body heat so it is you're way better off than not having it and it's going to keep you dry and windbreak and all that good stuff so they would be good how good i don't know i'd have to actually try that hopefully not in a situation where i really need it but maybe i'll test it sometime i would say even if you're going to try it on purpose i kind of alluded to this in the video you could put down like a bunch of branches from like evergreen trees kind of make a fluffy bed as a simulated or natural sleeping pad and then get on top of that, which even in a survival situation, you might be able to pull off. Although if you're injured, you may not be mobile enough to do something that involved, but that's a possibility and maybe something we'll test in the future. I don't know. So that's that. And I think that pretty much covers everything for now. I got a big old mess around me. I got to clean that up. I also uh, tested out the new Olight flashlight, the H16 wave on the uh, latest trip I did. I want to do a little more testing with it though at night just to see the beam patterns on higher. On the trip I used it just on the five lumen low mode which was actually a perfect amount of light for around camp so that's what I kept it on the whole time and the runtime was like 90 hours. I'll save it all for the review but all right so that's uh, that's what I got to say right now. Remember stay tuned for the t-shirts. I'll post a video about that but uh, yeah that's what's going on in my neck of the woods. Wow. That's like, I think Al Roker already has that uh, locked down. I don't think I can say that. No, sorry. I had a flashback to the morning news there. Till next time, I'm Syntax77, and you have fun out there.